chairs, dear guests and participants. On behalf of Cultura Nova Foundation, I have this privilege to heartily welcome you all to the seminar, The Age of Cultural Participation, Democratic Rules and the Consequences. This event is a part of a series of seminars centered around the topic of participation that Cultura Nova is organizing in collaboration with the Cultural Participation Network and the Center for Cultural Policy at the University of Leeds. And the Danish Research Network take part from Aarhus University. The series of seminars held in Aarhus, Leeds, and this one in Zagreb focuses on success and failures in contemporary approaches and strategies to participation from different perspectives, practice, theory, and the policy. This seminar has been selected as well as an ANCAC label event. With the aim of creating a more democratic, inclusive and equal society, but also as a consequence of technological development, the shift towards participation is evident in various fields, from politics, economy, education and media, to arts and culture. These days, participation represents the new democratic imperative, new opium for people and neoliberal mantra. But this rising of enthusiasm around the participatory democracy is followed also by skepticism. Critical voices appeared since emancip emancipatory dimension of participation disappeared in many cases. Namely, there has been a proliferation of labels given to the meaning of participation in recent years, creating various democratic forms from manipulation, tokenism, and consultation to devolving power and control. This has had consequences in the arts and cultural sector as well as the broader political sphere. The term participation is not novel in the context of cultural development. In contemporary society, cultural participation is one of the priorities of cultural policy agenda in Europe and the worldwide. The root of this democratization tendency in a cultural development is situated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, which also outlines cultural rights. Since then, the term cultural participation has changed, covering various forms of participation from traditional understanding being a passive observers to contemporary meaning from active creator, producer and facilitator to active decision maker. However, since neither practices nor policies of participation inherently or directly serve democratic purposes in a time of democratic deficit and the crisis of democracy as well as democratic institutions, the relations between participation and democracy is becoming an increasingly crucial issue. Observing participation through the lens of democracy points towards a gap between original intention and subsequent concrete results of implementing participatory strategies within cultural practices and the cultural policies. Furthermore, in the field of culture, the issue of cultural participation emphasized the tension between elitist and the popular approach to arts and culture, where elitist understands art as an exceptional area with its own logic, aesthetic values and the principles, while the popular one sees culture as an ordinary and a part of everyday life. Following these lines, the seminar will explore issues and concerns about the limitations, paradoxes and perspectives that cultural and artistic policies and practices are facing around the notion of participation in the context of democratizing democracy. Seminar aims to investigate participation, exploring failures, pitfalls and misuse of the concept, as well as possibilities of overcoming tension between arts autonomy and the broad citizen participation in order to rethink democratic standards in arts and the cultural participation, as well as in a participatory governance in culture. The program is shaped in a way to attract your interest. And I really hope you will find the program useful and inspired. I hope 
that the discussion within two days will get us closer to better understanding of the idea, importance, as well as the consequences of participatory development in culture, and also help us in building a brighter future for participation in culture. I wish you all wonderful, challenging, and inspiring seminar and the discussion. Now, may I please welcome our partners, Leila Jankovic from University of Leeds and uh, Birgit Eriksson from University of Aarhus to shortly introduce uh, uh, us further to their work in that uh, area. So please, Leila. Hi, I'm literally just gonna introduce myself really and just, um, Dears already mentioned that I'm from the University of Leeds where I coordinate a cultural participation network and the Cultural Policy Centre, <coughs> both of which you can sign up to um, to receive information if you're interested in finding out more. I'm currently doing some research with Lucy, wherever she's hiding, um, who's over there, um, looking at failures of participation, a word that, again, Dears referred to a few times. Um, and we're in, we're in the process of working on that at the moment, and we're talking with Dia and Birgit about some further work coming up in the, um, from that in the following years. We've also just this year at the University of Leeds launched a new master's program in audiences, particip audiences engagement, I can't remember the name of it, audiences engagement participation, which I'm leading. And again, if anyone's interested in knowing more about that master's program, I'm very happy to talk to you over the next couple of days. I'm not going to say any more than that, except for welcome, and it's good to be here. And I'll pass over to Birgit. Birgit, please take the floor. Hello, my name is Birgit uh, Eriksson. I'm a professor in Aarhus. Uh, uh, currently, I'm in Leeds, visiting Leila and colleagues uh, for three months. Um, and I have the, had this Take Part Network for the last three years or so, and uh, we are actually eight people from the Danish network visiting here and very happy to be here. Uh, thank you for organizing Dea and company. Um, we're looking very much forward to, uh, to the next few days, to the discussions. Uh, the Take Part Research Network has around 90 members, I think, uh, at the moment, and uh, well, the funding is running out in three weeks, but we will uh, plan to continue the work on, in these uh, areas in the, in the next years. And I, well, I think the, well, at least the Facebook group the, will continue in order for us to stay in touch with each other, which I think is really important in this field, both, both to, well, bridge cultural institutions and, uh, and researchers at the university. Yeah, I think that's that's it. I think. Ah, oh, yeah, maybe no. A commercial. We have a, we have a, this book, um, which is also up there. It was published uh, earlier this year. Um, uh, and Bjarke is somewhere sitting there, uh, one of my co-editors, and it was the result of a, a conference we had one and a half years ago or something like that, and uh, well, it's uh, highly recommended and it's good for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And finally, Cultura Nova. <laughs> Um, so, just a few uh, sentences about Cultura Nova. Uh, since Cultura Nova supports civil society organization in contemporary arts and culture, uh, it represents basically the public institutions, which is in a direct line to the concept of the cultural democracy, as well to uh, UNESCO declaration of the cultural diversity. Uh, but besides this financial support which we provide as an institution to civil society organization, non-profit, non-governmental associations in this very specific field of contemporary arts and culture, we also work as an operating foundation, which means that we implement our own activities through different areas, research, education, and the policy making. And some of that activities link as well to the issue of participation and the participatory governance. So one of our projects, which we implement thanks to the needs of our beneficiaries who 
running different uh, cultural spaces around the country based on the model of uh, participatory governance, using uh, public infrastructure and uh, trying to develop uh, a civil public partnership. We developed and implemented uh, a few years ago this uh, project uh, related to participatory governance. And uh, as a result of this uh, project, we published a book, uh, which is uh, uh, also in English, available online for downloading. This is the, the name of the book is Do It Together, Practices and Tendencies of Participatory Governance in Culture in the Republic of Croatia. But the first part of the book bring us uh, uh, the definition of the notion and the concept of participatory governance. And the second part uh, uh, show us seven uh, case studies from Croatia explaining the practices and tendencies which we have here across the country. In the middle of the book, you can find a list of uh, guidelines or recommendation or elements uh, which are necessarily in a case uh, uh, or in a context, uh, in different uh, occasion when you want to develop the practices of participatory governance. Uh, I said it's uh, elements, it's not a recipe, it's not the guidelines, because uh, the concept and the, uh, uh, the way how the participatory governance will be implemented, it really depends on the context and the formula one size fits all doesn't work uh, uh, here. Another uh, project uh, um, which is uh, tackled the issue of participation is the Adesta Plus project, European uh, project of 15 partners from seven countries which uh, address the issue of engagement and inclusion of uh, audience in arts and culture. Uh, through the project we try to develop uh, different strategies uh, which help uh, uh, organizational to change and to place the audience in the center of the organization. Next year, 2020, in the September, we will organize the summer school in Rijeka, and uh, we will inform you when we publish the call uh, for participation. And also within the project, uh, we establish a policy forum gathering uh, policy makers from the private foundation, but also from different uh, public bodies from the national and subnational level, trying to, uh, in collaboration with all of them, to improve or to influence uh, the cultural policy framework. And that's it. <laughs> So thank you for your attention and thank you that you decided to spend two days uh, uh, with us uh, on this seminar. Thank you and enjoy. So we are totally, I think, on a time. We are very, very fast, but um, we can start with our first uh, uh, keynote. Um, the title of the keynote is Everyday Participation, Culture and Democracy, and our speaker is Andrew Miles, a professor of sociology at the University of Manchester, and his primary interests are in culture, stratification, and the social mobility. So please, Andrew, take the floor, and after your keynote, uh, the Birgit Eriksson will join you on the floor. Thank you so much. And this is the pointer. So Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me, Leila and fellow networkees, to address this meeting. Um, I'm going to offer a provocation in this talk, um, casting cultural policy as an intractable problem for the notion of cultural democracy. Um, I'm basing my arguments on UK work. I realize that, and this is an international meeting. Um, but I'm hoping the themes and arguments will have a wider application, and from uh, the introductory comments, I think they might have. I'm going to try to develop the argument by combining findings from a series of research projects I've been involved in um, over the past 15 years, um, since I joined a, a research centre no longer in existence at the University of Manchester called CRESC. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about a national level project on 
everyday participation, which uh, ran from 2012 to 2017. But I want to talk a little bit about its precursor um, to make sense of the sort of narrative, uh, which was a, a project I did with the cultural sector um, on audience development issues in 2007, 8, 9. And then I want to try to do something which may appear slightly tangential, um, and I'm not quite sure that I can bring it in in such a way that makes sense, but it will refer to a different kind of research project altogether on social class in Britain, uh, which uh, took place in 2011 to 13 and attracted quite a lot of international attention, something called the Great British Class Survey. So in outline, uh, in case I lose my way, which is very possible, my argument is that the recent revival of interest in work on the everyday realm, in everyday life, um, in effect, and this is very notable in, recently in uh, cultural democracy, uh, sorry, UK policy circles, the revival of interest in the notion of cultural democracy, I should say, is largely rhetorical. So, at one level, this interest in cultural democracy reflects recent work on participation in everyday settings, of which my work is part, but by no means the only part. But I think it actually represents uh, uh, the latest attempt to defend traditional arts interests in the cultural sector. So while drawing on the notion of everyday participation, it simultaneously misrepresents it and reaffirms what I have termed in a series of articles since 2010, the deficit model of cultural participation. So that's the basic argument. I'm not sure that I'm going to be uh, talking much about resolutions to the problems I'm going to be identifying. I think cultural democracy is a problematic term. Um, from the Bourdieuian theoretical standpoint that I start with, um, which sees culture as a perpetual site of social struggle, it seems unachievable. So as I say, I don't have a, an easy solution to the problem of cultural democracy. But whatever cultural democracy might be, it seems that cultural policy is not the answer. And that we need to start by revealing what cultural democracy is not and what prevents it. Complaining about the elitism of the arts, which I do regularly. Um, my partner is in the arts sector, and we don't get on about this. Um, it may seem slightly arcane to complain about arts and elitism in a time of mass access to all forms of culture through digitization, um, when, in the grand scheme of things, arts, arts practices, traditional arts practices don't get funded that much, really from the public before, uh, per, uh, purse, to, it's particularly in relative, times, uh, relative terms, but the ongoing Brexit crisis in Britain indicates that the stakes are higher uh, than might appear, and that's where I want to bring in the, the, work, I mentioned, uh, the work I mentioned on, on social class. So, this is the, the outline of my talk. So I was first drawn to academic research on cultural participation by my involvement with the cultural sector, which I mentioned. And in that, at that time, it was in applied projects, actually, in the arts and criminal justice. So I, I went into prisons, and I worked with young offenders on uh, the effects of arts practices in terms of things like recidivism, in other words, um, whether, whether the arts could, could, could bring about a, a reduction in reoffending. And what was very clear to me in all of this work that I did was that there was a very strong narrative on the unique capacity of the arts to affect change in individuals. Um, and, and to do so in ways which were very, uh, kind of, in a way, difficult to explain. They were kind of, there was a mystery about them. Uh, and that immediately put me on edge as somebody who was who trained as a social scientist and uh, to, to carry out critique. So, um, that's where I started from in this world. And 
it led to me getting more involved with um, theorizing cultural participation and also getting involved uh, with policy makers. So I spent some time in the Department for Culture, Media and Sport on a, uh, on a, on a placement, if you like. So I, I was there for nine months and I worked in the evidence and analysis unit and I was, it was very interesting observing what went on there and the kinds of uh, debates and discussions amongst evidence makers and, um, and policy makers uh, in the same department. And the context to this period was, um, in the UK, was the new Labour administration, the sort of reformed Labour administrations of Tony Blair. Uh, and th that, that administration, those administrations brought in what people have called a neoliberal audit culture, which had the effect of accelerating and accentuating a shift to instrumentalism in the arts that had been taking place since the 19, late 1970s, really. So that money for the arts was tied to performance, uh, delivering uh, effects which were not intrinsic to the arts but were socially and economically useful. You'll be aware of this, this argument, uh, which seems to, and this, this trend which seems to have taken place across Europe. Now the arts lobby, um, saw this as a challenge to a long-running narrative around excellence, which I kind of touched on before, um, that the arts had something uh, particular about it, which gave it an intrinsic value, uh, that the values could be taken as read and they just impacted on people, uh, spiritually uplifting them and bringing them into a different way of looking at the world. And they, there was a counter to this instrumentalism shift uh, which was partly about taking it on, and particularly taking on the idea of the arts as, as taking a, having a particular role in the context of social exclusion. And this quotation in the middle here uh, is representative of, of that idea. So we will argue that the arts can have a lasting and transforming effect on many people's lives. For this is true not just for individuals, also for neighborhoods, communities, and entire generations whose sense of identity and purpose can be changed through art. So this struck me as being a somewhat uh, prejudicial account of what all those people out there who weren't taking part in the arts might be thinking and doing. Um, and this is what, what I, I, I call the deficit model of participation, a polarizing, classifying narrative where inclusion was is effectively a form of exclusion. And it was all about reinforcing middle-class norms about what it meant to participate and elite interests within the art sector. And here you can see in Britain and elsewhere a continuity with Victorian ideas of art as a civilizing process for working class people. And of course, alignment uh, with Bourdieu's, Bourdieu's idea of culture as a kind of weapon, um, as, a, as, a, as a social um, weapon. Those arguments came from a, um, a project I did locally in Manchester on local con uh, cultural institutions. Uh, so in the research centre I mentioned, we were interested in working with the cultural sector and having a, a, an outward facing um, approach to the understanding of culture. So we, contact, we got some money and contacted cultural institutions about their research interests. We were quite interested in, in elites within cultural institutions and how elite practices and elite interests fed through institutions. But the directors and executives that I, I interviewed wanted to know about how to fix people who didn't come to their institutions. So we were, in a sense, servants of, of them because the money had been given to, to um, understand their needs. So uh, I undertook a survey and an interview uh, project with so-called non-users. Non-users being defined as the people who in arts marketing literature ticked the box which said they weren't interested and weren't involved in the arts. And what that research showed was two things. One, there was a very rich cultural canvas 
everywhere, including amongst the non-users of the arts. But the non-users of the arts also sometimes use them, but in ways which are detached from traditional venues and practices and relationships, and in ways which cause them to disidentify from the idea of being arts interested, of being artists or part of the arts fraternity. So it, that, that research raised a number of issues. Um, I mean, I can, uh, oops, sorry, I'm going to go. Here, here, here's a, a couple of examples of what, we've, what I found in this, in this project. Two types of participant. Ghostly participants, so real cultural participants, people who did go to art galleries, uh, uh, or sorry, did engage with the arts, I should say, not, but not go to arts galleries, but they did so on their own terms. So here you've got some examples of people talking about the arts they do in their own time, on their own terms, in their own homes, and what it meant to them. So there are people here who who have personal engagements, but they're divorced from mainstream institutional contexts. So these are people who would not appear as arts interested in, in standard surveys. But they are interested in the arts, but in a different way to, the, to those who regularly patronize the arts in ways that are seen to be legitimate and respectable. And then I found that those people who didn't do the arts were nevertheless involved in a whole range of practices which could broadly be, be, be talked about in terms of um, culturally vibrant, creative pursuits. Uh, so here is an example of somebody going shopping, but in such a way that they have to plan out their week to identify what they want to do around shops. They don't have much money. This is somebody who lives in a social housing complex in, part, in a part of Manchester and finds shopping something very engaging in itself and, and something that they can be creative about, but only in their own terms. The other um, part of that research project was to look at data on participation and to look at some of the data that hadn't been processed in big surveys. This is the Taking Part Survey, the government's survey of participation in the UK. And I don't think you can actually see this because it's a bit too small. cultural participation in policy and led me to think about more work in this field and this um, this work was the uh, was the project that I mentioned on understanding everyday participation and this is a much bigger project it was national uh, long-term project cross university many different partners lots of different types of academic alongside cultural partners so sociologists through to people working in literature and heritage uh, cultural policy studies as well against the background of by the 2010 11 the end of the the blair regimes um, an understanding that cultural democratization the idea of getting people to come to the arts and opening them up uh, was failing and that inequality was rising at the same time. There were very substantial regional inequalities in funding. The regressive taxation that funded a lot of the arts through the lottery was being recognized. I think that's a, a characteristic of many European states that a lot of funding comes from gambling and gambling is mostly undertaken by poor people. So a regressive taxation. And also only, only a uh, vague idea uh, that, that instrumental uh, impacts of the arts were down to the arts, I think. So 
in this project, we decided to kind of start from scratch, to strip back the idea of cult uh, cultural participation, to start from the way in which the value of cultural part participation had been decontextualized in cultural policy, and to see where the value lay. So in other words, developing that, that project I mentioned on cultural uh, institutions in Manchester, bringing into play particularly the issue of place, how participation in place matters rather than participation generally. A lot of the data we had on participation was national, through um, national sample surveys. So what does it mean beneath those national surveys to participate in particular ways in particular places? This is, an, this is an outline of the research design. It's quite a busy slide, but what it shows is a sort of sequential design where we started off looking at the histories of cultural participation. We went back to existing national data sets to look at what, it had, what hadn't been covered. We then fed some of our early findings into the primary data collection aspect, which is the biggest part of the project, where we, we collected more or less the same kinds of data in six different parts of the UK, uh, or at least England and Scotland. And on the basis of that, we began, and more recently, to look at the results in relation to the work and policies of local and national stakeholders to try and look at the idea of impact. But in terms of an academic research project, the idea here was to mix up the method methodological approach, to bring to bear different ways of looking at cultural participation, not just where, but how. So we used in-depth longitudinal interviews, so uh, two ways of interviews in each place, um, looking at various different issues, but not talking primarily about the idea of culture. We did ethnographies, at least one ethnography in each of these places. And some of the subjects of the ethnography are mentioned there. So in Gateshead, for example, there was an ethnography of young people in care. In Manchester, there were ethnographies of parks and charity, school, uh, charity shops, and so on. So we, we, we got an awful lot of data. Um, we got it from places which are very contrasting in their profiles. So the way, the way in which we chose these places was to, to do a formal assessment of the amount of participation which is recognized by the state in these places and the amount of funding that went into them. So on the one hand, Manchester and Salford is a high participation area, according to the government, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, and it gets a lot of money. Peterborough, on the other hand, is a low participation area and doesn't get a lot of money. Dartmoor is low money, high participation, and Gateshead is high money, low participation. And then in, the, in Scotland, we had a slightly, there was a slightly different agenda, although they did apply that logic. It doesn't work in terms of symmetry. But the key thing there was the idea of, of what happens on the edges of places. So, Scotland is essentially focused on what they call the central belt, Edinburgh and Glasgow. Aberdeen is a big city, but it's very remote from the other two big cities. And the Western Isles are a whole sort of cultural system of their own around Gallic history uh, and language and the remoteness of, of the island, so having a particular economy. So we looked at those slightly differently, but using the same, the same methods. How am I doing? Okay. So there's an awful lot of research in there, and uh, I'm just going to pick out some themes, and I'm going to show you what we're doing at the moment. But here, here are the, some of the main, the main if, if we put it on one slide, what, we're, what we've looked at so far. The research can, confirms what happened in Manchester, obviously, to a large extent. You would expect it to. There's no such thing as a cultural non-user. We have a lot of participation in the everyday realm. Um, it's often very committed and skilled. I think there are issues with the, uh, the, the notion of, of creativity, which I'm, I'll come back to in a minute, but I would call it skilled and committed. Um, one of the things that the Arts Council of England did, or Arts Council of England did when it was conducting its work on how to attract more people into institutions was to focus on the individual, to think about the arts participant as a market consumer. Right? So the ba what they called the barriers to participation could only be overcome by focusing on the psychology of the individual. 
and appealing to, the, to her, to him, to overcome their lack of confidence, which is preventing them getting involved in the arts. This was, this is the, this was the narrative. But in fact, not only are, are most people not interested in the arts, but their participation is very much rooted in a social dimension and a longer term historical cultural dimension. So tradition, habit, community, family, sociality is what drives participation. Going back to what I've already kind of hinted at, few people may participate nationally. If you have a national sample, so how many people can you say are national participants? I don't know quite what that means. Um, but what came through from our research was just how much the meanings and relations of, of participation are embedded in place in the material world, but also, uh, and in the histories of places, particularly the economic histories of places, but also the way that, bio, that history is biographical, that people come into and out of places, bringing particular imaginaries with them, which either connect with or jar with local social imaginaries. And I think in terms of democracy, the really important point is that it's the social and civic dimensions of everyday participation the matter for sustaining social networks and defining what community means. And then more developing on the idea of the place, the creative city has been a central um, part of the rhetoric of contemporary cultural policy and investment from the center. But it is, in terms of what we found out, it's very much a, 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 a site of contention. And that what we found was looking outside of, of the center of cities was really important. Looking at the, where most people live, actually. Um, obviously, most people live in urban environments, but it's places on the edge of, of the urban that most people live. Over 50% of the population live on peri-urban, suburban. And these are the places that are not served by creative city investments. And they cause a lot of tension about incomers and, uh, and, 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 and neglecting what is already in existence in, uh, in city sites. Right, I'm, not, I'm, this, I'm not asking you to look at this in any, any detail, but um, we, we face a problem with 323 interviews, which is how, how to make sense of all these data. And we, we're only at the top of it, really. And uh, anathema to every qualitative social scientist in the room, what, I, what we decided to do was count them. So we coded all the interview data up um, in, in many different ways in order to get ways in to looking at, at the, some of the themes coming out. And although it's difficult for you to see, and as I say, I'm not asking you to read this, um, read this in any detail, what this actually shows, uh, these are mentions of different activities throughout two interviews. So it's a very, you know, it's a, you could, you could quarrel with the way we're doing this, but as I say, it's a way in. And what it shows here, it, it reaffirms the important, you may be able to see under attending activities, um, almost mm, four up from the bottom, religious services, really quite important form of participation. Surprise, us, 52% of people mention participation in religious services. But after, after that, you've got community and residence meetings, and then further up, community celebrations, carnivals, festivals. And what, what this is showing is it's, it, it's, it's kind of calibrating the extent to which um, the social and the civic matters in terms of participation. It's giving us a good idea that this is a really important area to look at. And we can look at the different kinds of cultural values that are attached. Does that come up? 
this is a sort of indicator of how um, we were looking at how place matters. So we looked at how different forms of activity, different forms of attending uh, played out in different places. And here again, we quantified it, we counted how many mentions there were by people in different places. And this is really, I thought this was rather interesting because most participation happens apart from one or two types of participation. Um, sporting events and clubbing, for example, in Manchester and Salford, community, computer games in Peterborough and Manchester. Otherwise, most participation seems to happen outside of urban centres. So it's in, the, it's in the more rural areas where you get more participation in more things. So again, the focus on the urban, the central urban, I think is misplaced. Okay, so here's where, here's a little bit more, uh, this is more of a provocation. So, I mentioned that there has been a move to embrace the everyday realm in UK cultural policy. And this, this, this move, I think, is, is a recognition of um, our work and other people's work. It, it, it represents um, an acknowledgement in policy that everyday participation, participation beyond the arts is important. And there's one interesting, particularly interesting uh, um, movement within this, an organization called 64 Million Artists, which is an indicative term in itself. So this is the idea that we have apparently 64 million people in the UK and they, they should all be considered artists. Um, and towards cultural democracy involves promoting their capabilities as artists. Arts is democratic. If everybody's an artist, it must be democratic and we can encourage their capabilities as artists. And a particular uh, part of uh, this group uh, at King's College in London wrote a very interesting document towards, called Towards Cultural Democracy where they emphasize the idea of everyday creativity. So clearly drawing on the idea of understanding everyday participation, but focusing it on the idea of everyday creativity associated um, with cultural opportunity. Then recently, the Arts Council of England produced a draft 10-year strategy starting in, will start in 2019 if it goes ahead, where the focus is on relevance. Now, this is a very interesting idea. We do not consider that certain types or scales of artistic activity are inherently of higher quality or value than others. That's an interesting idea. So I'm just now going to extract from some of the documents that I mentioned. And here are some of the, here are some of the narratives um, that kind of inform that thinking on everyday creativity and cultural democracy from a policy point of view. Cultural creativity, broad range of human creativity, that is in some shape or form about doing art. It's still about art. Cultural democracy isn't about low quality art or dominant. It's rooted in the principle of excellence. It's still about excellence. So art and excellence, that combination is still there. Now the Fun Palaces I think is a great project and it's part of this consortium around um, cultural democracy and policy. But these, this is rather a telling phrase. Excellence is something that can be developed rather than something that's an immediate requirement. So people aren't put off. So there's this idea here of the artist again as the conduit of excellence of artistic practice. So not quite as democratic as it seems perhaps. The whole idea of promoting cultural capabilities when you go out into the field and you see plenty of cultural capabilities which are not associated with the art is somewhat perplexing. So another way of interpreting this, and I'm, I'm just putting this out as a possibility, is that the, this rhetoric is normative. It's about invoking the special quality of the arts, about evoking the creative citizen as an individual neoliberal actor, linking the arts up with creativity, creative industries and productivity, and ultimately about the self-validation of, of the establishment. Here is um, 
a analysis that I did a long while ago on Arts Council board members from a, um, a document called Who's Who. And here you can see how continuity is mixed up with change here. So at the same time as UK cultural policy is reaching out to the idea of every day, but calling it something which is needing you know, uh, um, to be cultivated, especially in, re in relation to, sh to the arts, you have a continuing profile of, I of established um, arts groups on the, on the uh, governing body of the Arts Council. There's been a shift, it's moved away from arts form interests, but it's, mo it's moved only so, uh, to a certain degree. So on the one hand, the structure of arts governance in the UK remains largely intact. On another hand, and Leila will know all about this from her work, we did some interviews with cultural intermediaries, cultural people actually involved with producing Arts Council policy. This is around, we, these were interviews around the Taking Part survey. And the idea of targets being focused on groups that were minority groups. So the, the specific public service agreements, the targets that the Arts Council was supposed to hit um, under the public service agreement that um, they took on were to increase participation amongst lower socioeconomic groups and ethnic minorities. And here is somebody we interviewed talking about the problems of doing that, what they called putting perverse incentives in the system. So there's an organizational culture which hasn't shifted a lot. In this current spending round, <coughs> the Arts Council gives money away in various different ways. Um, one of the main ways in which it gives money away is to, <coughs> is to what it calls na national portfolio organizations. So these are organizations it funds over a period of time rather than just on a one-off project. <coughs> and I looked at their spreadsheet for this. And I, I saw that they gave, now this is, this is subsequent to the move towards uh, a more cultural, de a, 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 a more sympathetic approach to the idea of cultural democracy and to broadening access to the arts through actually looking at what people do rather than um, their previous cultural democratization approach. And here what we've got is, and so this has actually been a sort of, this is actually the, the phase in which they're giving more money out to causes that they, they wouldn't have ordinarily funded. So here it is, and this is partly prospective. It's the current round. So it runs over four years to 2022. These are the, these are, this is the amount of money that's been given to 841 organizations, 1.6 billion pounds. The top 10 of those 841, so 10 out of 841 get 31.1% of the funding, nearly a third. And of those organizations, four do opera, two do ballet, two do classical theater, two do combined arts, but that includes the South Bank, so very traditional combined arts. Five of those organizations are in London. The remaining, if you put the remaining 40 top funded organizations with the first 10, 50% of the funds go to those. So what's changing? And I, I picked up this, uh, this was a, a, a Twitter response. While it's great that ACE National, the Arts Council is thinking about cultural democracy, deploying the extant institutional framework that has delivered cultural inequality for decades gives this report, and they're talking to the report I, I put up earlier, all the credibility of Nigel Farage, who's the head of the Brexit party, playing sitar at WOMAD Festival, which is our very prominent festival of world music in the UK, a no change revolution. So I really probably didn't need to do anything except put that slide up rather than, anyway. This is where I just want to talk about the bigger state. I mean, so it seems as if things haven't changed. Things have changed, but not a great deal. You know, plus ça change, plus ça même chose. I want to talk about the, the wider stakes of this before finishing. As I indicated, you, you might think that, you know, cultural elites, you know, 
it doesn't really matter very much if only if only a few people go to the arts. It's not that money in the big in the bigger scheme of things, um, and people get their cultural fix through any 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 other any number of different ways. Everything's accessible and so on and so forth. So this is an argument that it does matter, and it does, it matters for sociological reasons. Um, and this is sort of working around the the Bourdieuian model uh, that culture always always um, has. Uh, issues of inequality attached to it. So I, I was part of a big team that did something called the Great British Class Survey in 2011. This was a very unorthodox piece of um, social research because it was unfunded. Uh, it was done in conjunction with the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and it was done through a web survey. So everything about it was kind of wrong from an academic point of view. Um, but it did cause a bit of a stir. We got 161,000 responses. So it was the biggest ever so, uh, survey of social class. And what was interesting from a, co and it went on to actually collect 320,000 over the following two years. But what's interesting about it from a cultural point of view is that we, we instead of measuring class by essentially um, a Marxist sort of viewpoint, purely economic in terms of the relations of production, often done through occupation, we try to apply a Bourdieuian framework to it. So we, we ask people about things which we could then assess their economic capital, social capital, and cultural capital on. And we combined those um, in ways which allowed us to, through latent, something called latent class analysis, to see how the class system looked from the point of view of this survey. And what it showed was um, a very clear separation out of an elite, a wealthy elite, who were well resourced in every one of those three. They had high incomes, high house values, high savings, economic capital. They had um, high rates of social capital, they were very well connected. And they had high rates of cultural capital, which we defined in two different ways. But just to give you an idea, this is how the elite di are distributed in Britain according to this survey. And you can see, with the red being the highest, how southerly it is and how focused on London it is. So one of the big things that we found was that London was acting as a kind of vortex, sort of attracting a lot of the resources in the UK. Um, this is cultural, high cultural capital, traditional cultural capital, which is also quite southerly and very strong throughout London. This is what we call emerging cultural capital, which is a bit, a bit complicated to explain quickly. I can do so in questions. A different type of cultural capital. It's, it is more about the everyday, but it's about particular ways of behaving with everyday forms of, of, um, of, of uh, participation. And here you see, again, strong in London, but also strong in urban centers down the spine of, of Britain. So what you're getting is a concentration of resource, of elites, and resources in particular places. And I thought this was quite an interesting, um, so I'm getting to the end now. This is, this is quite interesting. So this kind of combines what I'm saying. Um, what we have here is, in the, I'm going to, which are connected to social groups in particular parts of the country, which also have a political dimension to them. So, I think I'm gonna just go to there. It's very much as though this is underpinning the broader narrative of a, the idea of a culture war in the UK between those, inverted commas, liberal metropolitan elites and those people who are, inverted commas, 
left behind. So I think the, the idea of an arts elite and cultural, concentrations of cultural resource are really important in a broader political way in the UK at the moment. And I think things could be getting worse rather than better. So to just to go back, here is a, a bar chart showing London's cultural elites. So most of the decision making in the cultural sector is made in London. You know, these are where the elite circuits are. This is where decisions are made, the social capital is developed, where contacts happen. And on the left of those, the, the blue uh, bars on that bar chart are people who are under 30, and the red bars are people that are over 30. And very broadly speaking, you can see a rise in exclusiveness, whether measured by uh, um, an occupational way of looking at social class, so look at the increase, uh, that there, are, there are more traditional people from traditional professional backgrounds amongst the London cultural elites, more from modern professional backgrounds, there are more people from independent schools. So there is this sort of increasing exclusivity amongst the cultural elites. And I, I just picked this out of the Great British Class Survey. Work that's been done on more representative data and in more detail by people like David O'Brien shows very much the same kind of thing, that recruitment to cultural occupations is very much skewed towards privileged social groups and it's not getting any more open. And here is a, here is a, um, a geographical distribution of the London cultural elite in the Great British Survey showing how people are in the arts are concentrated in specific areas. So there is very much a, a, a subculture within this elite around the arts. So, just to finish off, cultural democracy. I don't think cultural democracy is anything that cultural policy can achieve. I don't know how people here would define cultural policy. I think, uh, sorry, cultural democracy. I think it's about understanding the meaning and significance of people's practices in, in a situated way through research, it's about understanding in the, in the Raymond Williams sense and, and, and what was mentioned at the beginning, that culture is ordinary, that we need to move beyond recognition and embrace to actually understand what cultural assets are in context, what the personal, social, and civic values are, arise, what, what, what values arise from those everyday practices. And we need to understand that from the ground up, which is what we've been trying to do in some of our post-research work. And this, I think, is really important for, for people interested in cultural research because it requires in-depth work. We found this out through being in places for a long time, at least a year in the main project, and in one place where we've been developing cultural policy from the ground up, if you like, local cultural policy, we've been there for five years. And there's one particular researcher who's done a fantastic job in becoming part of the community as a kind of research activist without being you know, an activist, which is, I think, a really interesting um, idea. So, if I was thinking about the policy implications, I think we need to move from uh, cultural to culture-led social policy. That's not to put culture to one side, but actually to put it much more to the forefront and the centre, but in, what, in the ways that I've, I've talked about, understanding culture as an everyday practice. It's, and that is beyond the capability and the remit of a specific cultural policy. It requires attention to structural inequalities. It requires remodeling of education systems. Uh, and it needs to understand that cultural capital is increasingly dispersed. So even in the everyday realm, I, I, I don't feel that, the, that everyday participation is some nirvana of productive communitarian practice, not at all. But I think that's where, where the potential for for democracy lies, but we have to understand and, and reveal how culture works as an excluding as well as an including practice. Thank you. I, I, I went to the... <laughs>
much for this, well, provoking, thought-provoking, at least, presentation. Well, you actually gave, you said you wouldn't give any solutions, but you kind of pointed at them at the end. But there's one thing I would like to ask you about, and it can also lead, because it can lead to two very different solutions, I think. So it's a problem mainly, as you see it, that we think we'll achieve democracy through culture, this instrumentalism, and thereby not trying to solve it in other ways. So in a way, that could be some kind of cruel optimism that we, that prevents us from achieving what we are hoping for, because we think that culture will do the job. Or is it that cultural policy reinforces the social hierarchies, like the Bourdieu version, and then leads to this culture war? I was not really sure if there was some kind of causality here, that it's actually culture that is the root of things, or is it just that there are some similarities? Because you could say if you, well, if you follow Bourdieu, the privileged will always find new ways of making distinctions, and the way we behave, the way we eat, the way we dress, the way we make friends, and the way we live, where we live, of course, all these things. But what is it, mainly, so is it that we, is it this cruel optimism, or is it that culture actually, yeah, does culture prevent us from doing it, or does it actually reinforce the problem? Well, I think our definition of culture may prevent us from doing it. This is what I mean, that to have an exclusive set of practices which are associated with some mystical property of value is the issue. So I have nothing against the arts, I mean, art forms. So for me, all forms of cultural participation are potentially meaningful and valuable. The issue is how they're mobilized to make distinctions between people. And this is why I'm not sure how any kind of policy can achieve something called cultural democracy. It's clearly a process. And I think part of the issue is to reveal what goes on in maintaining hierarchies and distinctions, which Bourdieu was very clear about the potential within cultural practices to hide the accumulation of power. So cultural capital is the one form of capital which is informed, if you like, by misrecognition. So to call out our traditional arts practices as something which are the preserve of privileged people and used in such a way as to sustain and even accentuate their privileges is the beginning. The next part is to understand that outside of those practices, lots of people do lots of different things which are socially and culturally meaningful, including the arts, but not just in, not in the recognized and legitimate ways that cultural policy would like them to do so. Yeah. And I think that that recognition of culture allows, which is, in, which is potentially inclusive, um, but also understands, um, understands the, uh, the distinction games that go on within, within the cultural realm, are the way to, to, to overcome the problem of participation. Participation, I mean, in civic life and democracy. So in the, in, in the place where we spent five years, the interesting thing is it's a place full of tensions. It's a place full of class divisions. But what holds the group together, I mean, I, I won't use the word community, but what holds it together is precisely the vitality of its local institutions and the breadth of cultural practices that it accommodates. Because that brings people into the civic realm in more neutral spaces, like the village hall, for example, to talk about how the village might be run and to object. And so in, it's an interesting place because in Raymond Williams' formulation about structures of feeling, you have, if you think of the dominant culture in the UK as being one which is around neoliberalism, creative cities, culture, creativity, economic growth through culture, 
then there is a residual culture in this particular village where we've looked at much more um, closely than other places recently. There's a residual culture which has, a, has a, 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 in part, a totally different value system. So in the village, there's an emergent structure of feeling, which is the neoliberal group, who, who, which, is, which is interested in um, using cultural assets to promote particular types of value, profit making in the, in the village hall and so on and so forth. And there's a, a, res, as I say, a residual culture which has... <laughs> So that one's more robust than we thought. That's <laughs> and there's a residual culture which holds out at least the prospect of different of different value system, one which can counter um, this focus on cultures as, as, around economic growth, mm. social hierarchies, and so on. Mm. In terms of what, what I was saying, I know that I know that the causality there is a causality issue with um, with the grass, as I was showing. Um, in terms of the Great British Class Survey. But I think here, what, what, I, what I'm trying to get at here is that people are speaking past each other because their networks are exclusive. And elite networks are exclusive in both social and cultural ways, which don't recognize or understand other, other ways of living, other ways of, of people. And I think that, you know, in fact, you know, people have actually got wise to that. And, and in part, Brexit is a protest vote. It's a protest against the, the people who constantly seem to benefit from globalization and neoliberal economics um, at the expense of people who have been, uh, whose, whose families have been working and brought up in a different form of economy, an economy which has been wasted and for which there's been no replacement. There are a lot of questions. I think we should just, uh, no, I, I, will, I will make one more question because we have actually, we have time. Um, and then you will have the, the, the words. Um, when you describe this, you had this quote about the young woman who, uh, who liked to go shopping. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you, you describe this as something like a culturally vibrant network or something like that. Why is it that? Why is it culture? You say, uh, of course, there's some kind of creativity, but it seems like, well, this is a solution to replace the word excellence with creativity, like yeah, sure, yeah. A, a lot of people have done. Um, but why is this culture? You think? Why is this? Uh, why is it vibrant? Why is it? Um, well, I don't think she's. I don't think she's. Um, she's clearly. Why not, is it a network? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't call it a network. I mean, I uh, think, didn't you? Okay. I, so. Maybe. I probably can't okay. show it. Um, I mean, she has a network, mm. even though she's a single mother, mm. you know, and she shares going out to coffee and talking about the world with other people, mm. and she engages with cultural products. Um, okay, maybe it's it's through a commercial culture, but I don't think she entirely buys all of that. She has her own way of making sense. Of cultural products, I think she puts things together in such a way um, that shows a, an appreciation of culture, even even an aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a short extract. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that those kinds of ideas about cultural activity um, should be exclusively attached to the arts. But also, culture is bigger than the arts, and that's what that's showing. Mm -hmm that her engagements in mundane things like going for coffee, window shopping, and cooking, buying food and cooking, are connecting up with the world uh, in a social sense and a broader cultural sense. So I, that's my, that, that would be my point. I think we should open for, I don't know who was first, but yeah, good, I'm not going to, good, okay. So uh, I think we have five questions, uh, so please make them uh, short. Oh, short. Oh, thanks for the presentation, it was really very, very interesting. Thank you. My question is, uh, did you research on the causalities uh, between uh, disengagement from conventional uh, cultural or artistic practices and uh, artistic education in secondary schools? Because I think I didn't hear any word on the role of education. 
and my interest is on mandatory yeah. education and what happens when there is artistic training or artistic practices and if you did any kind of research or correlation yeah. in no, on this. I mean this the, most of the work that I've been doing has been qualitative so I wouldn't measure I can't measure effects between variables um, we could do we could do so with a class survey um, we haven't done so because there's been quite a lot of um, controversy about it because it's a, a web survey and it's skewed to self-selecting uh, but in terms of the the questions we asked we didn't we kept that quite open um, because these people a lot of the people that I interviewed were from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds in so I didn't, we didn't go in asking about culture and what kind of cultural education did you get. I mean, the closest thing I can say about that is that a lot of people's engagement with the arts uh, that, that were not, that were non-used, that what we called non, what were called non-users, but we found them engaged in many ways, had happened as children being taken to museums through schools. So I think that raises a question of why they didn't regularly go to museums now. Um, Although most of them are very well, will very well dispute, disposed to the idea of museums. So I don't have an answer to the idea of if you had an arts education, would you have a different perspective on this? I suspect you would, up to a point. Um, what we found, uh, what, what I found amongst people who had an interest in the, in the, for the traditional arts in communities that we interviewed in was a sense that it wasn't, it wasn't a done thing to step outside of those communities and that it looked odd if you did so that kind of goes to my point about the fact that the art sector itself is constraining its uh, application and, uh, and the ability to accommodate people because of the way in which the idea of the artist and the arts is seen as a class as a class issue but I can't I can't answer your question directly I'm sorry Another question? I would just, uh, I would like just uh, to, to say that your lecture was for me very inspiring. Great, great Thank <laughs> lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, maybe because uh, you are coming from a uh, different sector, you are a sociologist, but uh, uh, it reminded me of one um, also sociologist, Karl Meinheim. You are probably familiar with his writings. Mm. And uh, I think, uh, as I understood your main idea, and it just uh, uh, come to my mind right now, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, somehow I understood your lecture as a way to say that uh, art, what we usually understand as art, is in fact culture of the cultural elite that we want to bring to the others. You know, it's, it's our culture, but we call it art, and in this way we, we give it higher you know, value than culture of these other groups, because they have, as you showed very well, their own culture. Mm. So I think that uh, when working with uh, citizens, with people, we first one, uh, must um, uh, be aware of that, and uh, if we want to work with them, uh, come uh, to them as equals, you know. Maybe, and if we want to, and we obviously want to do it so, to, uh, uh, to introduce them our culture, if we think that way, then uh, to bring it in a way that it's just another culture, not better, not uh, brighter, not uh, cleverer, but our culture. We want to share the, our culture with their culture, and even know what their culture is. Uh, Could you try to be short, please? Uh, what? Could you try to be short, please? Because oh, sorry, there are many sorry, questions. Okay. That's, that's just my comment, and mm. thank you okay. very much. Sure, well, thank you for the question. And I think, um, yeah, I, I think our culture and their culture is probably getting, that this is the issue, I think. That, that, it is very much our culture, and we often are in quite privileged positions more generally. And so it's difficult for people to associate with our culture because their experience is very different. I think, I think the interesting thing, I mean, there's a lot is talked about cultural appropriation and uh, in, in the current vernacular, and I, you know, I have problems with that idea. 
but it's very interesting that the history of forms um, is that they shift their social bases around. So opera and certain types of literature were more popular in the past than they are now. So it is, for me, an, it's an issue of cultural classes a, in a broader sense. It's the idea of social class and the way in which certain types of people behave around objects and processes. And so I don't know about opening, you know, I think it is about understanding and empathy, and, but I think until you start redistributing um, resources as well as opportunities, it's quite difficult to see that kind of equalization of respect happening. Because unless people have got a, a stake in things, uh, or if they feel they haven't got a stake in things, then the negotiation almost is a non-starter, really. But thank you for your question. Yes, yeah. We're still there. Um, but I, I really have two questions. One of them goes in terms of the social role that the Museum of Ebony Bay has played mm. in this. The social role that that plays. Have you done any kind of investigations into the different types of social, and the, the social impact and the social value that those different types of, of participatory engagements have? And I'm, I'm in particular interested, of course, in, in whether the arts has any different Should we just kind of acknowledge that we are elites and we'll always be that and then keep it at that? Or close down. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, on the first question, um, the, those, the, that sort of uh, quantification of qualitative material is really where, where we've got to. So I can't, I can't in detail break down. This is one of the things we want to do because we're about to start writing a book um, on the basis of those data. But I did look at, um, so using the you know, qualitative software analysis in vivo, uh, we were able to look at the kinds of values that people attach to different types of practice. Um, and it's on a slide, which I probably lost now. But <laughs> um, it, it, it was rather interesting, actually, that the arts um, had a relatively high score for expressions of excitement. This is not museums, but this was the arts, the, high, the inverted commas, traditional higher arts generally, for excitement, but low on inspiration and uplift. Whereas, um, <laughs> uh, I, I'd have to have, I'll see if I can find it, but it, whilst I'm talking, other, other forms of participation were more uplifting, uh, which was quite interesting. I'll see if I can find it whilst I speak about your other question. Um, I think museums, I mean, I, we, the University of Manchester, inverted commas, owns uh, at least two big museums, art galleries. And so I, it's quite interesting to talk to colleagues who, who run them and work in them. And the, you, the Manchester Museum is taking, uh, taking the opportunity of a, of a, a refurb, a big, a refurbish, big refurbishment, to take its collection out into the community, to leave objects in strange places, and to do pop-up stuff. Um, which I, all I think is really interesting. Um, I just wonder how far, you know, what kind of reach, if you like, real significance that can happen. I think it's good to open up public places 
public uh, investment, uh, in publicly invested institutions to all kinds of people. But it seems to me that it's the culture of the places that needs to be addressed. And I think I probably agree with the work that's been done on uh, recruitment to cultural occupations, so that when, when you go into a museum, uh, you don't often see mm, many more different types of faces than white middle class ones. Um, so I think the idea of the opening up cultural work, if you like, to a broader range of people, not having the, the usual suspects with the same kinds of education. Um, you know, maybe if you're, if you're showing collections on, on, on different cultures, you need different kind of interlocutors, different intermediaries, um, so that you actually mobilize collections in, ter in the terms of the people who might, who might have some background interest in them. I, I'm not a museologist, and I would, it, it would be absolutely wrong of me to suggest otherwise, but I think I really like what our museums are doing, but at the same time, there is the, still the narrative of the, these are non-participants. You know, we're trying to get people to participate. So unless you can recognize what goes on in people's communities, and I don't know how you do that, except build museums right in the middle of them and staff them with the people who live in the communities, maybe. 